Welcome, everybody, and happy Easter. This presentation on Edgar Cayce on Deuteronomy 30 and John 14 to 17 is being done today, Sunday, Easter Sunday. Uh, as you all know, most of the world is on lockdown, and in order to facilitate and better serve our community, we're going to be doing this uh, without an audience, basically, and then we will, once the world becomes unlocked again, present it again at Unity, but for the purposes of recording, we're going to be doing this today and get it on board to YouTube sometime next week. The disclaimer that we're doing is based on the Edgar Casey readings according to Deuteronomy 30 and John 14 to 17, which was put into Casey readings a lot of times. This is my interpretation thereof of both what is written in Scripture in the Bible as well as what the readings say. You are more than encouraged to take your own studies and find what it means to you. This is the purpose of all of the Edgar Casey readings is for each to find the understanding that comes to him or her. Consequently, this is my interpretation of this topic. The Edgar Casey reading number 3384-1 is just one of the multitude of readings that Casey gave in which he states, read and study carefully the 30th of Deuteronomy, also the 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th of John. This is a very, very good portion of the scripture, and we're going to talk about each of these chapters independently. Now, Casey said to read them. Well, what does he really mean? He gave a reading here at 3578-1 in which the reading incorporates that out of John 14, verse 2. In it, he says, In thy searching, then begin with reading each day just a few verses of the 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th of St. John. First, read in the 14th. In my Father's house are many mansions. Dwell on that, not for an hour or a minute, but for a day as ye go about your work. Who is your Father? Whom does he mean? In speaking to thee, what does he mean by mansions? And that there are many mansions in his house. What house? It is indeed thy body that is the temple. Many mansions are in that body, many temples, for the body has been again and again in the experience of the earth, and thus they are sometimes mansions, sometimes huts, sometimes homes, and again they become those places where we dislike to abide. This is how Casey suggests that we read these Bible verses for our own edification, for our own ponderance, to think about these. And as we go along, if there's something in there that is a little bit foreign to us, question it. Ask questions about what is a mansion, you see? And from there, when we start to do this, now we get the deeper understanding. And as we will see when we get into these, we will also recognize that we have access to all of the answers that we are seeking. Now, when he's talking about the mansions, the mansions potentially to me means these are our bodies. And depending on how we've lived life, sometimes they are indeed mansions. Sometimes they're homes, sometimes they're huts. But one of the things here at, that he closes this statement with is that they become these places where we dislike to abide. And having seen some elderly people go into the end stages of their lives, I can affluently say that in the majority of the cases, they were ready to go. They didn't want to be here anymore. And maybe this is what Casey is talking about here when he says they become those places where we dislike to abide. 
very interesting comments on this, but this gives us the basis on how to formulate our studies so that we can better understand what is written in the Bible. Deuteronomy 30, Old Testament. This is the fifth book of Moses behind Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then obviously Deuteronomy. It was written at the end of the 40-year sojourn through the desert circa 1405 B.C. And in it, the words in Deuteronomy are also companions to those in Isaiah, I'm sorry, Joshua 5, 6 to 12. And it covers about 30 days, and this was done on the plains of Moab. Okay, where they weren't going anywhere. Now, in this, and f just for FYI, the source that I used was my King James Bible, the Open Bible, and it has a lot of, it's a cyclopedic, it's a biblical cyclopedic in that it has a lot of information in there that is put in there by biblical scholars, so it's to put forth a background for us, but I use this one, particularly used to be my uncle's, and I'm using it for my references to Scripture. Now, it's in there that it contains three sermons from Moses to the Israelites. Deuteronomy 30 is part of the third sermon that Moses put forth. And the title of it is, What Will God Do for Israel? 27, 1 to 30, 20 is the scripture that it covers. And now what it does, it institutes what biblical scholars call the Palestinian Covenant. So what is the Palestinian Covenant? Well, again, please remember, it wasn't Moses who gave it this name. This is biblical scholars of the modern day that came up with this naming convention. And in essence, what it is is a renewal of the Mount Sinai Covenant with Moses gave there. And it covers two very important aspects in here. You have what's termed the legal aspect and the grace aspect. The legal aspect of the covenant was immediate and conditional, and this is put forth in Deuteronomy 27 to 29. Okay? And it is predicated on obeying God's laws. Okay? The grace aspect was forward-looking and unconditional, and this is called part of Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 9. This is yet to be realized. Think about this in a couple of ways. First, we have been told from the beginning to follow God's commandments. Moses was putting out to the Israelites to do that. Reading the Old Testament, we know that they didn't always follow through with that. Consequently, bad things would happen when they forgot God. Consequently, the grace aspect has never been realized. If we take forth what Casey said that Israel means, in that it is seeker, then we can take a personal attachment to this. And we are being counseled to take our own, take our own path and follow God's laws in our own life. And if we do that, then we'll get the grace aspect. Now, speaking only for myself, I haven't done real well in the first part of the covenant, okay? The wasn't always good on the legal side of things, but, you know, chances are this ain't my last rodeo down here, so I'll be back to do it again better the next time. Consequently, though, when we do finally catch the golden ring coming by, then we will realize God's promises that he made that is attached to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 30, 16. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Here we see both aspects, 
the legal aspect is to keep his commandments, walk in his ways and keep his commandments. The grace aspect, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest. Putting it out there. If you do this, you're going to get this. Now, let's go to the next three, verses 17 to 19, Deuteronomy 30. We get a further understanding of the legal and grace aspects. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whither thou hast passed over the Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Again, the legal aspect and the grace aspect. It sounds pretty perilous. Thou shalt perish. That means you're going to eventually die and you're not going to achieve all that you could possibly have achieved here. If you also recall back in the Old Testament that there was a lot of times in which Israel came up with false idols such as the golden calf, etc., and this is what they're being warned against doing. Don't be putting your faith in something that you can actually feel, see, and touch. But this words down here, I have set before you life and death that is very important. That's very important because this is how our material existence is predicated. Every single moment we have a choice to make. What is our choice going to be? Is it going to be for life or is it going to be for death? Is it going to be for good or for evil? It's a choice that we have to make. And as Casey told us, this is the price we pay being live in materiality because we're, it's always a trying to find balance. And we're not going to be able to hit the home runs all the time. But again, those are your Deuteronomies 30, 16 to 19. Now, Casey chimed in in the Search for God readings, in this case particularly, 262.53, in which he counsels us to trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in him whom thou claimest to be in accord with that he would have thee do. Know that his ways are not past finding out. Be not in the shadow of doubt or fear, but keep the heart singing, knowing that in his own good time and way, he will bring the desires of thine heart to pass that are in accord with his will in thine experience. Again, he's, we're still seeing the same things again, the legal aspect and the grace aspect. His ways are not past finding out. Follow his laws. What are the laws? It was stated in Matthew 22, 36 to 40. I love the God with my whole heart, mind, and soul, my neighbor as myself. Quite simple. Quite simple. That is the whole thing. Every other law is predicated on that. Consequently, it's not that hard. It's just a matter of doing it. Doing it makes it harder for us. And when we do, we get the grace aspect that he will bring the desires of thine heart to pass that are in accord with his will. Now, we're going to touch about this in deeper detail in John, but in accord with his will is a very key point here that we'll, we'll investigate in further detail. But that is your Deuteronomy, okay? In book three, search for God, book three, 262, 119, the experiences through which man passes, as God gave in other periods, to become aware of his purpose for entrance into what we know as materiality. Then the awareness of the way comes through the thought of man, the faith of man, the desire of man, such as ever held by that one who became righteousness itself passing through all the phases of man's desire in materiality. Again, more 
very powerful words here. What is our purpose? Do we have our purpose? Our purpose should be to do God's will on this plane. Do what he would have us to do. Again, Matthew 22, 36 to 40. Love God, love our neighbors as ourselves in all of our aspects. Now, think about what he's also putting out here. How does awareness come? Awareness comes through our thoughts. Where does the thought come from our mind? What did Casey say about the mind? The mind is the builder. We are going to use our thoughts. We're going to have faith. And then by framing our thoughts and maintaining faith, our desires fall in line so that we can, in fact, use Jesus as the pattern in our own ways as we see fit to be able to do it. Jesus overcame the entire realm of materiality. He fought temptation for 33 years. We meet temptation on a daily basis. We've got to train ourselves to learn to overcome those temptations and put them behind. Again, life and death. Doing God's work with the correct intent is choosing life, succumbing to our own carnal material desires, in essence, choosing death if they're not predicated properly. Choose life, love the Lord your God, obey him, and be faithful to him. That's the crux of Deuteronomy 30. This was put out in the Old Testament, but it's every bit of relevance today in today's world. To me, I'm a big fan of the Old Testament because until you fully understand what the Old Testament's saying, it's kind of hard to get your mind wrapped around what the New Testament's saying, but that's just my opinion, and consequently, very, you know, I see a lot of times where we stop giving credence to God and we start become self-absorbed, things don't end well. We see that in the Old Testament several times. In their cases, it lasted for centuries. This brings us to John the Apostle, John 14 to 17. Now, I bought this book 32 years ago, A Closer Walk, Reflections of John 14 to 17 from the Edgar Casey Readings. When I opened it, I found a couple of interesting things. One, I bought this on 25th of March, 1988. I have the ex-wife's credit card number and our own phone number. But it took me 32 years to read this book. I've had it that long. I just now read it in preparation for this presentation. It kind of reflects that my understanding of the full body of the Casey work was very limited to things that piqued my interest back in the day, primarily a lot on the way of reincarnation from my mother as well as the Atlantis things. But I also found that I bought several other books in here on that day. But again, I finally got around to it, a little slow on the uptake. But again, this was just you know, my exposure at that time. It took me a long time to get with the program because as the old saying goes, when the student's ready, the teacher will show up. In this case, it took 32 years, but hey, I'm here. Anyhow, on John, 14 to 17. This is only, these four books and four chapters cover only a few hours in duration. And it's the time between the Last Supper and Jesus' arrest in the garden. This is what is covering in here. And in it, it's basically Jesus' farewell speech to the disciples, though they didn't quite fully understand it. But as time went by, rapidly they did. And it prepared them to go forward with the work. We've heard the acronym that Bible stands for, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Well, this was the disciples getting Jesus' basic instructions before he left the earth. One of the key components of this is that the Holy Spirit is brought forth into their awareness in these chapters. 
And because a lot of this is based on Jesus speaking to the apostles, in the Bible, if you have a red-lettered version, all of Jesus' text is in red, and these four chapters are very red, to say the least. But when you go through and you read these chapters, what we're going to come up with is the key word of what Jesus is telling the apostles is believe. Believe in what you've seen, believe in what you know, and believe in what you're going to do. John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Casey, in his wisdom, came up with, hence, as he indicated, each soul should be aware that while the material motives must be within, to keep harmony in the body and in mind, they must be in accord with the way. He is the way, the truth, the ideal. And what he's talking about is that we need to learn to find balance between our physical selves, our mental selves, and our spiritual selves. And then we need to take these and go forward into our material world in balance. And when we do this, we become aware. We have the awareness of what Jesus was doing. Because when we keep these things in balance, now we are having our eyes focused towards Jesus, the pattern who became the Christ. And if we go forward in living life as Jesus did, then we tend to make a lot of progress. But there's going to be trials and tribulations too. But we have got to keep all of this in sync one with the other. 14.7 If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. In the Search for God readings, Casey put forth the following. Then, in the spirit and in the mind that thou hast brought thee to that understanding, and the consciousness of his love made manifest, abide ye day by day. And a lot of what Jesus was talking about in this part here was a bit foreign to the disciples. And what he was talking about is that we're seeing that if we keep in the spirit, Father is in the spirit, and we have it in the mind. Now, what we are seeing is physical manifestations of God the Father on earth around us. He sees it, and as he, as he will allude to, with each other. We see it in nature. All of these are manifestations of God. This is where we're going with it. This next reading, John 14, 12, is incorporated into the reading number 900, 243. 900 is Morton Blumenthal, who, the more I study the Casey readings, I find to be a very intriguing individual. This man was a very deep thinker, and obviously the ARE today would not be here for what other than what he had really put forth because he would really supported the Casey family and the ARE early on. And I'm a, really, uh, the more I read the Morton Blumenthal readings, and there's like 468 of them, I think, the more you get into, you know, how intense this man truly was. I really would have loved to sit down and talk with him because he had a very, very interesting outlook on all of this. But in here, we see in John 14, 12, Casey incorporates this in here. Yet is seen in the words of the Master, greater works than I do shall ye do in my name. We've seen that a lot. What does that really mean? Casey continues and says, that is wherein and when the entity uses self in that same way may do even greater works than seen 
For though they may not be in the manner of walking on the water or stilling the storm on the sea, yet the compassing of space and the transmuting of faith, power, force, strength to the heart of the weary and the heavy laden becomes even greater than these material conditions seen of men, that their faith might be made strong in him. We are all evolving, we are all developing. At some point in our development, we are going to reach the same state as the Christ. We too may very possibly walk on water before it's all over and done with. But we don't have to wait to do until we get there to do it because what Casey is telling us in this reading is that the greater works can be done right now by going in and transmuting faith, power, force, strength to the weary of heart and those who are heavily burdened. Love your neighbor as yourself. Give them a hand. Help them, help them enlighten, help them see, help them see through these difficult times that they are personally experiencing. And when we do this, we are in essence walking on water because this is what we can do right now. And we don't have to wait till we get into the Christ state to be able to do it. This can, is something that we can be doing right now, today. And when we do this, we get bonus points because it's important that we take care of the things that we can do right now. Find out what your hands can do and do it. Stay focused on the moment. If you see somebody in need that you can help, help them. Bring their burdens, make them lighter. And when we do this now, we are living what John 14, 12 was telling us to do. This is another curious one that probably gets a lot of misinterpretation. 1414 14 says, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. All right, Lord, how about let me win the lottery? Ain't happened yet. Try like hell, but it just hadn't happened yet. But why? Let's read what Casey says in another Search for God reading. Not my will, but thine, O Lord, be done in me. As he has given ye, ye have all been called to a service in him. Some to sacrifice here, others to toll and to disappointments there. Yet he has promised and is able to keep that he has committed unto thy keeping against any obstacle, whether of the earth or of the unseen activities against thou, fulfilling that whereunto thou hast been called, if thy desire is in him. That last part is key. We've got to desire to do his will. That is the key part. If you ask how that you can do better serve him, you will get the answer immediately, I may add. One of the things that I have found is that public speaking is something that scares britches off people. They're scared to death of getting up there and speaking in public. Well, guess what? Here we are doing it. Same as I'm doing it, John does it, Dora does it. And what are we doing? We're putting ourselves out there. Say, hey, this is my interpretation. This, you know, we're workmen unashamed. We're doing this. But for me, before I even take the stage, I am on my knees praying. I'm asking, dear Lord, please channel to me your words, thoughts, deeds, and ideas so that together we can put forth that which you know is needed by those who will witness this presentation. His will, not mine. And when I do that, the words just come. And I guarantee it, pretty slick. I also, when I was teaching, teaching people how to trade the financial markets, I would do the same thing. I would ask God to give them help. Give me the words that I can use to help them. 
I don't know what's, what disconnects they have, but this is what I do. This is how I apply it. I'm asking in his name, hey, Lord, help me, because I have no clue what the hell I'm doing. And I'll tell you, it works. It absolutely works. It makes life a whole hell of a lot easier. Trust me. 14, 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. John 14, 16. Hmm. Key word here. He shall give you another comforter. What does that mean? Remember, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples. They used him as their comforter because as long as he was around, everything was fine and dandy. But he knows that he's fixing split. So he's going to fill in the void. He is praying to the Father, he will give you another comforter. Now, back to Morton Blumenthal's reading, number 335. For, as was given, I go away that I may prepare a place that where I am there ye may be also. If I go not away, the comforter will not come. Did my spirit not bear witness with his spirit? It would not be possible then for the God within thine self to bear witness with thyself that ye may be brought to the oneness with the Father. Now, think about training wheels on a bicycle because that's kind of what we got going here. The apostles, with Jesus around, had the training wheels because he was guiding them and telling them which way to go. Now, he's fixing the bag out. Training wheels are coming off. Now they've got to ride themselves. But instead of having a physical comforter in the form of Jesus, he is assuring them that he is, there is going to be help if they will but seek with his spirit and here's the key point about this. So long as Jesus was here, these people weren't thinking on their own. They deferred to him. Now they're going to have to put their big boy pants on and get after it and start thinking with the comforter that's coming to put forth the word. In other words, what would Jesus do in this case? What would Jesus have me do in these circumstances is the point that, that Jesus was putting across to them. And when they did this, then they are going to learn to defer to the Holy Spirit and in such create a oneness between them with the Father just as they had with Jesus. And it was a really, uh, really important section here. And the comfort it will not come if Jesus is here. As long as Jesus was there, these people weren't thinking on their own, per se. Time for them to take the next step up. Jesus had to leave in order for them to step up and drive his message forward 2,000 years ago. And that's what's happening. And that's what he was talking about here. 14, 26, 10 verses later. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever have said unto you. In 452, 6 reading, Casey says, Understandest thou that I will bring to remembrance those things that will give thee the answer to the questions that arise in thy experience in all of thine undertakings for me. He was telling them that there's going to, as you go forward in life without me, there's going to be situations, there are going to be questions that you are going to have posed to you that you're going to have to contend with have faith trust and understand that the holy spirit will bring the answers to you and it will also said and we also see in other scriptures that it will come when it is needed you'll be able to remember everything that you need to remember doing my work it applies to us as well if we will do his work, then we will get good and proper guidance from upon high. 
in this back to the search for God then the Christ spirit be manifest in the world even as the Christ consciousness may make thee aware of that promised as the comforter in this material world then the Christ consciousness is the Holy Spirit or that is the promise of his presence made aware of his activity in the earth the spirit as the Christ in action with the spirit of the father the Christ consciousness when we invoke those terms we are actually talking about the Holy Spirit who resides at our disposal and when we do this we are creating a mental awareness of our minds of what we should be doing that is the Christ consciousness when we take action we then put forth the Christ spirit so long as it is acting in the concepts of the Christ consciousness. Now we are doing what Jesus would have us do. That is the difference between Christ spirit and Christ consciousness. Christ consciousness is the mental awareness, the desire to do God's work. The Christ spirit is actually following through and doing it. And when, they, when we do this, we are working in consonance with the Father, just as what Casey was, to, or not Casey, but Jesus was telling the apostles to do and what would, in fact, happen. Next verse, 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth peace, give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. It's the second time we've heard that let not your heart be troubled thing in this John 14. So what is he talking about? Let not your heart be troubled and let it be afraid. My peace I give you. In the prayer group readings, the 281 section, Casey expands on it a little bit more. In such a manner, each may become then more and more attuned to that spiritual awakening which brings that peace as he promised. Not as the world knoweth peace, but that conviction within the heart that though the experiences of the physical are oft as torments in our material experience, there is the advocate with the Father and he will comfort, he will bring peace, harmony, and understanding to those who seek to know his face and who have the courage to dare to do the right in the face of all oppositions of every nature. If you read the historical accounts of life after Jesus for the apostles, more cases and more times than not, it was not very pretty. It didn't end well, let's say, for them. And what we are seeing is that we have to develop the peace by doing this and knowing that we are doing the right thing for the right reason, regardless of what everybody says about us, then we are acting with the conviction of the heart. As we are in our heart, so are we, says Proverbs. And when we do this, we find an inner peace that is unlike anything else that we can actually feel intrinsically on this world and this now is the comfort this is the comfort that we are finding that we have with us the world thinks of peace as not killing each other you know we're not there's no angst about that could be considered physical peace and certainly not a bad thing but when we take it down into the individual level we find something that totally trumps that level of peace. Because now, by finding that peace, it becomes a little bit more addictive to us, where we're going to want to go forth and do it more and more and more, so as we continue to receive these feelings. And the only way we're doing it is for doing the right things for the right reasons. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. This is exactly what we're talking about right here by finding that intrinsic peace that comes from walking in step with the Lord. 
we can actually spread the light little by little and eventually we will make a difference because it does begin with us individually. 1430. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Hmm, now, what is Casey, what's Jesus doing? He is giving them a, an association with a monarchy, right? Where you have kings and queens and princesses. Well, here comes the prince of the world. In the World Affairs readings, the 3976 series, Casey tells us that there are those two principles two conflicting forces in the earth today. The prince of this world and that principle that says to every soul, fear not, I have overcome the world and the prince of the world hath nothing in me. Can you say that? You must. That is thy hope, that the prince of this world, Satan, that old serpent, hath no part in any desire of my mind, my heart, my body, that I do not control in the direction it shall take. These are the things, these are the principles. Jesus overcome temptation continually. We are faced with temptation daily as well. Many, 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 many times a day, I would add, because it comes in many forms. There's just not one form of temptation. It's like going and getting a variety pack of cereal or something. You got a bunch of different ways to being tempted. But what he's saying is that we've got to be aware of this and we have got to take action. We've got to nip it in the bud, so to speak. Cut it off. Fear not, I have overcome the world. By overcoming the world, he has deterred every form of temptation. This is what we're trying to do. We are now on this, this mission to do this. And we're not going to do it like Jesus did it. There's no way. However, Casey tells us it is always line upon line, precept by precept, here a little, there a little. It's going to take time and don't be in a hurry. You're going to accomplish it. You know? So this is where it is. This is the hope. Can we do it? We must. We must be able to overcome the temptations of the world. And we'll be given numerous opportunities to do it, but it starts with a mental awareness that it's out there and it is attacking us constantly. Switching into John 15, verse 2. Again, Jesus now starts to relate spiritual growth with growing stuff. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So what do we do? If we have a fruit tree, do we prune it back? Why? So that it'll bear more fruit. As above, so below. We see it about us. They saw it back in that time too because they were very agriculturally based. Reading 16, 16, 1, Casey tells us, And he whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and purgeth every one, that they may bear fruit indeed in him, not such that the teeth of the children of men are set on edge by the sourness of their lives, but rather that there is the stimulation to activity. We will not be given more than we can bear. Maintaining a proper mindset in times of tribulation and troubles, such as we are in today, can be used as stepping stones. Whenever we have problems, we're going to be emotionally charged oftentimes. And we're going to have a gyration of feelings and emotions coming out and thoughts are going to be quite differently. These trials and tribulations we have 
are purposeful for us. It's not just to kick us while we're down, but rather it's as a lesson. But we've got to understand, we've got to get out of this victim mentality and say, oh, woe is me. Get rid of that crap and go with it. I said, okay, well, this happened. Yeah, that sucked. Now what am I going to do about it? And what am I supposed to learn from it? That's the point that we're trying to get to here. And this is exactly what Jesus is telling the apostles. And he's telling them, there's going to be trials and tribulations forthwith in your lives. But put them in the proper perspective. And that's what we got to do ourselves. Because if we can sit there and understand that the bad things that we are enduring are purposeful and for a reason, then we can learn from those experiences, thus stimulate activity in the future for us so that we do it better again the next time around John 15 12 this is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you 14 413 1 Casey tells us let love be without dissimulation that is without possession but as in that manner as he gave love one another even as I have loved you willing to give the life, the self, for the purpose, for an ideal. Other than this, these become as that which will bring in the experience, that in which each will hate self and blame the other. Hmm. That's pretty powerful. Now, we've all seen TV stories, movies, read books, that have to do with the topic of love. And in a lot of cases, it leads to perceived love becomes jealous love. And jealous love in time often turns around into murder, mayhem, kidnapping, and other vile things. But that's the story. But if we think about that, is that true love that's driving this, or is it something else? This is possessive love that we see in the movies. I married you. You are mine. I own you. That's what we're seeing. That's the message that's put out there. That's not what Jesus said. Love one another as I love you. Go forth and put forth positive thoughts, not possessive. What is your purpose? What is your ideal? We're all down here we're all trying to achieve not everybody's going to go and do things as you would have them done and that's okay but we need to be making sure that the love is not a possessive type of love but rather unconditional love that's where we want we've got to set it up let them go if you love something set it free and if it comes back to yours it was meant to be you know, and that's what we're seeing here. Oftentimes, that which will hate self and blame the other. If we don't get what we want, things tend to be emotionally charged and upsetting to us. And as humans like to do, we are often very good at placing blame and pointing the fingers and doing things that we don't really need to be doing. But that's what we do when we don't get our way because we weren't thinking of love in the proper perspective. We're sitting here trying to be possessive and controlling. We're not allowing other people to express themselves and go about their business as they see they need to do because we're starting to become a little bit more authoritative in our relationships. Next verse, 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So as ye expend your body, your mind, your purposes, your desires to bring to others the consciousness of his abiding presence, so may ye know his peace, so it may be thine as ye accept, as ye use, as ye apply same in thy relationships to thy fellow man day by day. Now, Jesus gave his physical life for our benefit. 
that certainly fulfills John 15, 13. We read and see and hear about battlefield stories where soldiers take a bullet to protect somebody else. They'll throw themselves on a, a grenade to save the troops. They give of themselves. Very heroic things. But we don't have to be that way. And that's what Casey is telling us here. How are you going to apply? When you give of yourself, what are you giving? You're giving your body, your mind, your purpose, your desires to other people. When you do that, you're throwing yourself on the hand grenade. You're giving your life because what are these things? This is your essence. And by doing that for the benefit of other people so that they too may become aware, then you are giving your life to your friends and neighbors. And this is what Casey and Jesus is telling us to do. It's not saying, hey, I'm going to go get hung up on the cross here for your benefit. That's not what he's saying here. It's what happened, but it really wasn't necessary in the true essence of the words. Ah, oh, 1518. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Wow. We see a lot of that today. Let there be less and less resentment of any kind respecting others or in the apparent negligence on the part of others. Remember, as he has given, if they have hated me, they will hate you also. If they have misused me, they will misuse you also. Now, Think about what happened here. Why did they hate Jesus? He was very, he was a, a passive activist, if you would. He wasn't doing nothing other than showing loving kindness to other people. And it, in doing so, people thirsted for it. They took it, and then he became a following. And then the ruling power perceived this as a threat to them. And then what'd they do? They went after him. Think about what we see any time we have tragedies. You know, public figures are going to extend their thoughts and prayers to those who are, you know, afflicted and whatnot. But sure as heck, we know that on the other side of the coin is your thoughts and prayers are doing anybody any good. So again, what are they doing? They're putting back hate as opposed to taking, you know, words. Thus, respecting others and the apparent negligence on the part of others. You know, people are going to say that. They're going to, you know, they're not going to agree with you. Everybody has their opinions. Everybody's on a different level, spiritually, physically, mentally, morally. And what's going to happen is that there's going to be dissonance and they're not going to necessarily agree with what you've got going part of the game and this was also a warning to the apostles going forward because this is exactly what they all ran into after Jesus left and we see it again today thinking about this along the same lines we have 1524 I'm sorry 15 yeah 1524 that if I had not done among them the works which none other man did they had not had sin but now have they both seen and hated both me and my father that's very interesting Casey chimed in in the 104 readings for search for God yet as judged by man in the earth and of the earth becomes as that which is weakness but the weakness of man is the wisdom of God think about this we just said that Jesus was doing loving kind acts and because he was doing these things he attracted a lot of attention and a lot of followers but he wasn't being an alpha male about it he was doing it out of love for the right reasons being in the earth and being of the earth are two different things Jesus was in the earth not of the earth 
the of the earth types wanted to remove Jesus because they perceived him as being a threat. And what was he doing? He was acting with loving kindness, doing all of the right things. He was doing good. When people do good today because they don't appear to be manly, then they are perceived as being weak if they choose to act out with loving kindness to choose turn the other cheek, etc. But what Casey's telling us, that is the wisdom of God. Man's perceiving it as being weakness, but it really isn't. It's only weak to the mental, physical man, but it is the wisdom of God. And a lot of this here, too, with what Jesus was saying up here, they had not had sin. Perhaps what he was doing was invoking a mirror effect, whereas people would see what he was doing and then realize within that that they didn't do that. They didn't share his values, attitudes, and beliefs towards these things. Consequently, they were ashamed of themselves and in such became mad about it to such an extent that, well, you're making me feel bad by being here, so we're going to off you. In a lot of ways, that's exactly what happened. It was the effect. Because what did the people say? You know, what did they... They didn't really go out and defend Jesus. But yet, they could have. And they could have been very vocal about it. And that was up there to Pilate. That was the last chance. Who should I set free? Barabbas or Jesus? And they chose. But again, we got to think of the world that we live in. And if we follow God's commandments, love that God with their whole heart, mind, and soul, and the neighbor as yourself, which means follow the fruits of the spirits, that is going to be perceived as weakness in modern man in a lot of ways. But it is the wisdom and strength of God. That's John 14, 15. John 16, 17, the second half. And in these, there's fewer Edgar Casey readings that refer back to these chapters specifically. However, within these, there are several critical messages, and they tend to be forward-looking in nature, and it helps to develop the theme of oneness, because now we're going to start to see how Jesus evolved the message to start to include him, his father, and even the apostles into a centralized theme of oneness. And when we look at these experiences, maybe we look at them in, as in terms of consciousness. Where are we, what are we aware of? The Closer Walk book had this over here on page 49. The love of the Father, the leaving of this world, the going to the Father, the tribulation and sending of the Comforter all take place in consciousness. The revelation of knowledge, the fulfillment of Christ's promises, and the answer to his prayer unfold from the highest consciousness. Becoming one with Christ, one with the Father, means the uniting of an individual with the universal consciousness. Now, a lot of times when we read the Bible, we tend to leave ourselves out of the equation. We see everything that was going on with Jesus and his inner circle, if you would. But remember, it wasn't purposeful. Jesus had the foresight that what was going on at that time 2,000 years ago is going to be going on 2,000 and maybe 4,000 years hence. Same song, second verse, nothing new under the sun, as Casey would say. So when we start to think about this, it's telling us to go in and develop the consciousness that we are included. Not only is it Jesus, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the apostles, it's you too. 
that's you too. It's very important for us to include ourselves in this. 16.24 Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. Book 3, Search for God. Ask, and ye shall receive, saith the Lord, who is thy keeper. Then in thy prayer, thy meditation, call ye on him. For he is not afar off, and with the spirit of love that is his commandment to thee, that ye love one another, ask in his name. Again, higher purpose. Not about me, but for the others. The whole message of the grand command and the golden rule is to put others above ourselves. We should be the last that we think of. And when we ask at times to deal with lives, ask for a greater good. When there's times where we have personal tribulations, health issues or something to that effect, maybe we ask for healing with the intent that we may have the strength to go forth and do his work as he sees we have need for. We're now putting forth a promise to him and say, please heal me so that I have the strength to further do your work. It ties right back into a lot of the healing readings in which Casey says that, you know, if you're going to be healed, what are you going to do with it? Why heal you if you're just going to go right back down the same path that you were on? Consequently, we get our symptoms perhaps Removed, but we don't always get the true healing that could actually happen. But always with the love of another. That should be our first and forethought. Straight out of, you know, again, Matthew 22, 36 to 40. John 17, 4. Here Jesus is praying to the Father. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Casey says, The belief, the faith, the doing of that thy hands find to do, which is in accord with, in compliance with his desires, gives reason, gives purpose, accomplishes that. For what were his words? Father, I come to thee. I have finished the work thou hast gavest me to do. Hast thou finished the work he gave thee to do? Hast thou sought to know the work? Hast thou walked and talked with him oft? It is thy privilege, will ye? Oftentimes we tend to live life. We just hop in the little canoe of life and go right down the river wherever it takes us. We're not always purposeful with the mind of serving others. A lot of times the purpose of our lives is self-service. We're going to do the things that's best for moi. Maybe, what is your purpose here? Well, we, he tells us time and time again. You love yourself, as, you know, your neighbor as you do yourself. We've got to always, this is the message he's striving for, is do it for other people. I'm going through this ordeal for you physically. You are going to have the opportunities to crucify your own desires. This is how you do it. We've got to be mindful. We've got to be purposeful. Take that closer walk daily, frequently, and it'll amaze you what you find when that happens. 17.7 Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. Again, Jesus is still praying to the Father, telling him his apostles have had an epiphany. For it all reverts itself to that one principle, oneness of all things, and the relationships each entity or each unit bears to another unit. To really get this, you have to think back from back to creation. If we take that in the beginning, we had 
God. And then God, from God, souls were created. We're all cut from the same cloth. There is no difference between us at the root level. We each have free will. It is through the free will that the divisions and differences have occurred. What we're being counseled to do is look past the differences. Look for what is the same and know that everything is all of one. Everything is all of God. There is nothing but God. Everything that we see and experience is our reflections of this. It is the oneness of all things. Our world would be a lot better of this. And in fact, in one of the Casey readings, he stresses it, oneness, oneness, oneness. Know it until you get past the concept that there are, there's nothing but the one, then you're not going to go very far in your development because you're going to be making self-centered choices as if you are above the rest. And he's saying we are all one. We know this. I am of the Father. So are you. We have this birthright. Embrace it. You embrace it and you realize it through the way you treat your fellow man. 1721. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be in one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. In the Jesus readings, the 5749 series, Casey tells us that live that in thy life, thy conversation, thy activity everywhere, and indeed then may each in that manner bear a real Easter message to others. For he hath entrusted to thee, those that love him, the redemption of the world, to make known his willingness, his care, his promises, that may be the activity of each and every soul. This is what it's all about right here. That the Father may believe that you have sent me. And that message, not only to the apostles, but 2,000 years later, is present in that God sent his only begotten Son. We realize that. Now we've got to manifest it through our own lives and bear a real Easter message to others. Our, what of what? A resurrected life. That there is no death, per se. And the way that we're going to do it is the willingness that we're going to hit it. We're going to get everything that he's promised for us. Straight back to Deuteronomy. There's your covenant. There's your Palestinian covenant. There's your grace if you will do this. Give that message. The promises are germane. They're still in play. Just because we're on the New Testament, not the Old Testament, doesn't mean that they're irrelevant. They're not. Thinking about this, in my mind, there is no reason that every day cannot be Christmas, Easter, or Thanksgiving. Every day can be Christmas, Easter, and Thanksgiving if we so choose that. If we so choose to conduct ourselves as we are being counseled to do in Deuteronomy 30 and John 14 to 17. If we will do that, every day can be Easter. Every day can be Christmas. Every day can be Thanksgiving. Because what we are doing, we're conducting ourselves towards our fellow man to bring an awareness to them in some way, shape, or form. It may be something as simple as a smile, opening a door for somebody, an act that we think is very minor. But it could mean the world to somebody else if we would just do it. So if we focus on this and we look for the opportunities to make every day Christmas, Easter, and Thanksgiving, then we're going to really put ourselves on the fast track, I believe. Again, from the Closer Walk book, 
We are sparks of light in an ocean of light, thoughts in the mind of God. We are individual points of consciousness uniquely expressing the universal. Once an individual experiences self as a life extending beyond the confines of the physical body, there is no limit to growth in awareness he might attain. That is a very uplifting segment right there. If we can think about growth and awareness on a much higher level in our bodies, then we are going to take it outside and we're going to go. But think about what it means with respect to the afterlife. If we maintain the thoughts that we have here and our ideals are based on the Christ spirit and the Christ consciousness, then we are opening the floodgates to limitless. While we are in our physical bodies, we are greatly limited. But that doesn't mean that we cannot open the door. That means we can tap a higher potential. And all we got to do, but it begins right now. It begins right now by thinking about these things and doing them and thinking outside the box, the outside the box of the physical body. Go beyond that. Go beyond the confines of the earth with your mind, your thinking. And if the ideal is focused, then certainly we're going to go and achieve much greater deals. This was a little bit of an interesting reading here. 452.6 asked, what book on psychology would benefit the body? Answer, the psychology of life, preferably that given in John, the gospel of John. That is, the psychology of life. For how does it begin? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with him. John 1.1, 1, 1, right there. The psychology of life is the gospel of John. That's interesting because that tells me that the entire gospel of John is something worthy of deeper study. Casey pointed to 14 to 17, certainly. But there's other chapters that have immense meaning as well. But that's a very interesting statement that the psychology of life is found in the Gospel of John. Definitely something to look into. Continuing with the same reading, another question. What part of the New Testament definitely teaches reincarnation? Answer, John, 6 to 8, 3rd to 5th, then the rest as a whole. Very interesting. The psychology of life, reincarnation. What are we being taught here? What are we being told? Not only is the Gospel of John good for perhaps human life, but perhaps it's every bit as relevant for soulful life as well. Again, worthy of a deeper study. Viewed in this manner, all of John 14 through 17 becomes a focus that can bring the reader one step closer to that ultimate experience in consciousness, to be one with Christ, resting, fulfilled, abiding in complete awareness of the oneness with the living God. And if you want a better study of John 14 to 17, it's right here. Right here, these three books are Search for God. We'll give you John 14 to 17 and Deuteronomy 30. That's what these all three books are about. Deeper study, very well written, and available to all who choose to seek. Thank you very much.